Hello and welcome to On Air. I'm your host, Clara Serevich, bringing you another set of political news. Some arresting, some alarming, and some just plain weird. In our report, we'll be focusing on the anti-LGBTQ law passed in Georgia last week, and later we'll talk about the recent revision of the world's nuclear status quo. Since we are edging closer to elections in Moldova, today we are going to talk about the various ways you can buy votes. We'll start with legal ones, namely through political merchandising. For instance, you can offer temporary tattoos and fake tans with your name on it, like some Tories did recently during the party conference. Boris Johnson has just released a memoir titled Unleashed, and I wonder if it was among the goodies. You can also sell political souvenirs and fund your campaign, like Kamala Harris and Donald Trump are doing in this last stretch of their election bid. The Democratic candidate is offering some interesting, if problematic, merch that allows you to broil steaks while remaining camouflaged. But all this pales in contrast to the cornucopia of Donald Trump's offerings. Bibles, sneakers, action figures, plastic straws, watches. You can snag this very tasteful one called the Trump Victory for around $100,000. If that's too steep, there's always a cheaper version at $499 named Fight, Fight, Fight. And unsurprisingly, it's made in China. Trump may also be the first politician to have created a perfume. Once you pop the president's head off, you'll savor the scent of Victory 47, only for $119. Donald Trump's body odor has been described by Adam Kissinger, a fellow Republican lawmaker who had the privilege to smell him as, and I'm quoting, take armpits, catch up a butt, and make up, and put that in a blender, and bottle that as a cologne. If you can't afford any of these treats, there's always chocolate. Now, that last idea may have come from Vladimir Putin, who's known as someone very sweet, and hence had some chocolates made with his likeness back in 2018. They were called Very Victorious Putin, victory again, and contained red pepper and vodka. But where was the nerve agent, I ask? Those sweets were then sent to some unsuspecting children in the Siberian city of Omsk who found Putin's vodka-laced benevolent smile gleaming at them in their New Year's baskets. Now, I think if I really had to choose among these offerings, I'd take the Tory fake tan. There's a country that could certainly use all the political merchandise money can buy, and that's Moldova. Later this month, Moldova is due to hold presidential elections and the referendum on EU membership. Both ballots have spurned Moscow's panicked influence campaigns to subvert Moldova's possible EU integration and the re-election of the popular pro-European president Maya Sandu. Despite being one of the least known countries in Europe, Moldova is crucial to the geopolitical and security architecture of the European Union. To illustrate my point, let me just give you a number. According to Moldova's national security advisor, Stanislav Sekrieru, Russia will spend around 100 million euros on interference into Moldovan democratic processes this year. This is a very large investment to win over one of the poorest countries on the continent, roughly the size of Maryland and with a population of two and a half million, one third of which lives abroad. But if you look at a map, you may begin to understand. Due to its strategic location, it's a battleground of shifting allegiances, sometimes leaning pro-Western, other times pro-Russian. Think of it as Florida, but with arguably better food and drink. Along Moldova's eastern edge runs Transnistria, a region that broke away 30 years ago with Russia's support. Transnistria has long served as Russia's European intelligence service base and an arms and drugs trafficking launchpad for the mafia organizations affiliated with the Kremlin. Before 2014, Russia could access Transnistria through Ukraine or Moldova's port on the Danube. But those routes are now closed and Moldova has introduced tough checks on Russian military personnel and cargo moving through the country. Damn, that's so much money and geographic capital lost. So unsurprisingly, nearly 14 million euros from Russia have been pumped into the largest voter bribery in recent history. The man behind the scheme is Ilan Shaw, the founder of a now-banned pro-Russian political party and clearly very skilled at money laundering, since he escaped to Moscow after stealing one 
billion dollars from the Moldovan banking system. That's about 12% of the country's GDP in what was dubbed the fraud of the century. Shaw orchestrated this political circus with the flair of a reality TV producer by launching a Telegram chatbot to recruit people in what sounded like a scripted game show. Register for 500 lei, complete a few tasks for 2,000 lei, and if you sway the majority at your polling station against the EU, you might just park it 5,000 lei. Because nothing says trustworthy politician like jumping ship to a new country while evading justice, the pro-Russian Moldovan opposition is considering him their leader and has created a political bloc also named, you guessed it, Victory, after Elon Shaw's banned political party of the same name. And possibly after Donald Trump's cologne. As he was trying to promote Moldova's Russian ties, Shaw used a barrel in lieu of a blender, ketchup was swapped for grapes and the secret ingredient, armpits, was replaced by feet. Another victory worth dancing for. In February, Volodymyr Zelensky said Kiev's security services had intercepted Russian plans to break the democracy of Moldova and establish control over the country through violent means. Shaw was named as the linchpin of the alleged coup and has since been sanctioned by Brussels. Hopefully, the EU president, Ursula von der Leyen, brought more substantial help than some political souvenirs when she visited the country on Friday. While she can't compete with the colossal levels of bribery, even the mafia bosses running Transnistria may eventually see more opportunities in trade exchanges with the European Union than in swallowing Russia's poison candy. Now, there's another upcoming election we should be worried about, and that one takes place in Georgia on October 26th, as the government is set to deepen its pro-Russian turn and has passed a sweeping discriminatory law against sexual minorities, we focus on this other aspect of the Kremlin's foreign influence, namely the weaponization of anti-LGBTQ legislation and the promotion of traditional family values as a tool to marginalize civil rights movements. Forget the economy, corruption, or the myriad other problems that might be plaguing your nation. If there's one thing that's always good for distracting the populace, it's stroking the fear of the LGBTQ community. Russia is the ringleader here. After the 2011 to 2012 protests sent a chill down the Kremlin's spine, Putin and his cronies started looking for new ways to rally the troops. What better way than to pit traditional values against the so-called decadent West? Enter anti-LGBTQ legislation, where love is no longer just a battlefield. It's practically a national security threat. The persecution has only intensified over the past decade, culminating in late 2023, when Russia's top court designated the LGBT community as extremists. It is unlikely that many people will come to our defense. The electoral base that the Russian authorities need will either be neutral towards this or most likely will welcome it, unfortunately. It's clear that the goal here is not to protect family values as advertised, but rather to weaponize conservatism. Vladimir Putin even went so far as to call the LGBTQ plus movement satanic, presumably because nothing says defending traditional values like demonizing an entire community, while your country's divorce rate soars above 74%. Not to be outdone, Georgia is following close behind. The ruling party, Georgian Dream, appears to have borrowed a few pages from the Kremlin's playbook, especially ahead of October's elections. Like Russia, the Georgian government is leaning hard on religious conservatism. This law is the most terrible thing to happen to LGBT community in Georgia. It includes everything that was accepted uh, by Putin in Russia, like over the last decade, and even more. The government's anti-LGBTQ plus stance is meant to push its deeply religious population into fearing the West and, in turn, keep dreaming the Georgian dream. In Slovakia, the right-wing government is trying to adopt new regulations to limit LGBTQ plus propaganda in schools. Slovakian Minister of Culture Martina Šimkovičová, having previously blamed homosexuals for Europe's low fertility rate, had this to say to LGBT activists. <laughs> If you have mental disorders, you should get treatment and not impose on people the belief that what you are is normal and everything has to be the way you want it to be. 
In the end, the fight against LGBTQ plus rights in these countries isn't just about hate, it's about control. Fear is a powerful tool, and authoritarian-leaning leaders know just how to wield it. From Iran to North Korea and China, the constant expansion of nuclear capabilities is a source of alarm for Western countries. Russia's nuclear saber-rattling has become commonplace and Iran is closer to crossing the nuclear weapons threshold. The Cold War playbook no longer applies as current circumstances are much more complex. We'll learn more about them in this report. Last month, the Kremlin announced updates to Russia's nuclear doctrine, lowering the threshold for the use of nuclear weapons by expanding the list of conditions that would justify the measure. The updates are intended as a warning to the West and a way of stoking fear over additional aid to Ukraine. The sentiment doesn't stop at the Kremlin walls. Russian society seems to be absorbing and reflecting the talking points propagated by Vladimir Putin. It might make the arrogant Europeans at least think a little bit. I think that the previous doctrine was too vague, with all its mentions of if, when and maybe. These moves are clearly meant for domestic consumption. And although the Russian nuclear arsenal is meant to protect its own territory, there is an exception. We reserve the right to use nuclear weapons in the event of aggression against Russia and Belarus as a member of the Union state. This includes cases when the enemy poses a critical threat to our sovereignty. In June 2023, Russia began deploying tactical nuclear weapons to Belarus. This marked the first time since the fall of the Soviet Union that Russian nuclear weapons had been stationed outside of Russia. As Vladimir Putin said, the two countries comprise a supranational union, which means any major changes occur there in unison. Move up, shit. In an interview aired by Russian state television in late May 2023, Belarusian dictator Alexander Lukashenko stated that other countries who were willing to join the Union state would be given nuclear weapons. Recently, Alexander Lukashenko proposed that Kazakhstan join the Union state. I appreciated his joke. The main threat is not the only threat, since we also see threats coming from the proliferation of nuclear weapons from Iran, from TPRK. Uh, we also see challenges coming from the attitude and the policies from China, but the main threat would definitely be Russia. The amount of weaponry Moscow is receiving from Tehran is sparking growing concern in the US and UK. Not only due to Iranian ballistic missiles replenishing Moscow's stocks, but also because Russia may be assisting Iran with its nuclear weapons program in return. Uh, we see how much military support uh, Russia uh, gets from North Korea, but also from uh, Iran. The alignment between Pyongyang and Moscow has intensified in recent months, with Putin visiting North Korea for the first time in nearly a quarter century back in June. According to South Korea, soldiers from north of the 38th parallel have been sent to Ukraine to aid Moscow's efforts. These moves could suggest Putin has decided to share something very special with Kim Jong-un. A nuclear program is the holy grail for authoritarian leaders, providing a security blanket to hedge against their isolation. Russia's weakening position on the world stage could lead to the spread of nuclear systems to other pariah states in the future. Welcome back. We have John Todd with us. Hello, John. Hello. There's a madman theory of nuclear threats, uh, and it posits that only authoritarian, unhinged leaders uh, may use nuclear weapons, while democracies with uh, human rights and checks and balances and uh, international law would be highly reluctant or even paralyzed uh, to, uh, to take action. And does it mean that democracies have kind of preemptively lost uh, the nuclear deterrent game? When you put it like that, I'm going to say very simply, yes. Democracies are these places where we discuss the use of weapons. We get protests, you know, hundreds of thousands of people can roll out on the street when they see war in other, uh, you know, other civilizations, and they want to make sure it doesn't happen to them. So we've got protests. Now, you look at places like China, Russia, and North Korea, you don't have protests there. And let's face it, North Korea is far more likely to see protests about too little food than it is about too many nukes. Uh, when you look at what's happening in Ukraine, we've got Zelensky asking for the use of long-range weapons to hit targets in Russia. Now, we've seen uh, Keir Starmer may well be up for this, but Joe Biden, the American president, uh, has 
paused for the moment. Um, some would say he's hand-wringing, others would say he's judiciously mulling the possibility of nuclear escalation. And this is exactly the sort of story and the situation that Russia wants. I mean, returning to your madman theory, don't forget that we've got tactical nuclear weapons across the border in Belarus uh, put there by Russia. Uh, Russia controls the nuclear warheads, uh, Belarus controls the mechanism delivery, but uh, Belarus's president has a say in the use of the bombs. So we've got two madmen on the button next to us. China, Russia and North Korea are three nuclear states that are currently aligned with overlapping interests and shared benefits. However, when Russia and North Korea signed a mutual defence treaty, there was a deafening silence from China, and also China has not made any overt changes to its nuclear doctrine. It has not threatened to use nuclear weapons as opposed to these two. Um, can China become the adult in the room uh, in its relations with Russia and North Korea? Well, uh, to some extent, it's already adopting that role. Uh, as Russia looks to boost its war effort, it's been cozying up to North Korea. Yeah, we saw Kim Jong-un send birthday messages to the Russian president, uh, telling him he's his closest comrade. Now, the day before that, Kim said Pyongyang is... Uh, speeding up its steps to become a military superpower with nuclear weapons. And it's widely thought in exchange for weapons that uh, the Kremlin's sharing its military expertise and military technology. And a, and a South Korean politician recently suggested that Pyongyang is in a position or is uh, preparing to uh, develop plans for a nuclear submarine. Now, in this race to develop weapons, China is taking a very different approach. Uh, in response to Putin's doctrine comments, uh, China reiterated that nuclear weapons should not be used. And uh, there are some that are arguing that uh, Russia's become a sort of vassal state or even a Chinese colony, while foolishly uh, dreaming of becoming an, you know, being an empire. Whilst Russia and China have teamed up in an anti-Western, anti-global, anti-American front, the situation works in Beijing's favour. Uh, China's able to import uh, cheap Russian raw materials while at the same time flooding the country with its consumer goods. And at the end of the day, China's looking to spread its influence uh, via investments in the Belt and Road Initiative. And the last thing it wants is Mr Putin going nuclear bonkers. Speaking of whom, uh, in August, Ukraine surprised Russia with an incursion on its territory and embarrassed the Kremlin. And a week later, news broke out of a fire at the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. And both Russian and Ukrainian governments uh, blamed each other for it, but it seems quite absurd to think that Ukraine would risk a nuclear incident on its own territory. While on the other hand, it is likely that Moscow would call attention to a possible nuclear disaster as a veiled threat. And I get the feeling that this may be one of the most alarming developments in this war, uh, along with other grey zone warfare from, from Russia, because it could normalise targeting nuclear facilities and give the guilty party room to claim it wasn't involved. When, when you look at what it's, what's happening at Zeporizhia, it's, it's madness. Someone's firing rockets there. Now, as you say... It's not in Kyiv's interest, and uh, we had an early indicator of what might be at foot here, but uh, uh, an early uh, International Atomic Agency inspection in September 2022 uh, was met with uh, a number of at least one Russian handler whilst they were inspecting the grounds that was busy explaining to the uh, UN inspectors that a rocket that had apparently come from Russia's direction had actually flipped in the air at the last minute and uh, had come from Ukraine. It was all part of this disinformation and just completely trying to upend the facts as they appeared on the on the ground. Mm -hmm. Now, you're talking about the fears of targeting nuclear facilities. Uh, Iran recently launched almost 200 ballistic missiles uh, towards Israel and Israel's mulling its response. Now, recently we had uh, Ed Hood Mubarak, the former Israeli Prime Minister, predicting that Israel's going to mount a large-scale attack on uh, the airstrikes on Iran's oil industry and possibly a symbolic attack on a military target related to a nuclear programme. It's in the mix here on the, you know, on the global stage. OK, thank you, John. Thank you for this conversation. And thank you for watching. Join us next week when we'll be discussing trade wars and spying hardware.
See you soon.